morning, good morning. Let us still ourselves as we invoke the presence of the Almighty God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all you lands. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Lord God of the universe, we come today to celebrate the blessed privilege of coming before your presence. All week long we have toiled, we have labored, Lord, with the anticipation that you would meet us here today in this place. And for that, we are so grateful. We ask now that this worship service that we are about to render would be pleasing in your sight, because you are worthy to be praised. Thank you for this blessed congregation of people of God that you've gathered here. And not only the services that we render here, but all throughout this community and all throughout the world as people lift up your holy and mighty name. We pray for those who are sick and shut in, those, Lord, who are recovering from procedures and difficulties, and even those, Lord, who thought well to stay home because of the current coronavirus. We pray, Lord, for those families who continue to lose loved ones, those who are on the front lines, as well as members and friends and family members of ours that we know who have contracted this awful, terrible, terrible disease. And then, Lord, as we come, we are mindful, we are very mindful of the social unrest that is taking place all over our country and all over our world. Father, I pray for that the quest for justice and Quality continues to go on, but that you would be at the forefront, that people will understand that you are the answer to all of our problems. What the world needs is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. So we thank you for that. And as we come today to pray, and we really don't know how to pray, but you told us that when we pray, that we ought to pray this way as you talk to your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Invisible 
though they are, have been understood and seen through the things he has made. So they are without excuse. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Judy. Thank you all who have participated thus far in our service. And I do have a word for you today. I think it's very appropriate for us now that we are our second week back into the sanctuary. And again, I want to thank Dr. David for capturing the services virtually as he did. He and his beautiful wife so faithfully. And there's just a difference in doing it before a camera and doing it before live and living folk. So I'm just so happy to be here today. Thank you so much. Father in heaven, we do now regard and we acknowledge your presence. For every time the book is opened, every time your name is mentioned, you are there. For you said where two or more are gathered in your name, you are there in the midst. Doesn't have to be a house full. But where two or more are gathered, you meet us there. So I'm asking this morning for your preaching power, that you would anoint me as you have appointed me to deliver this word, Lord, this word that I feel is very appropriate for the world today. 
So bless us now, <clears throat> keep us, keep me now in your care. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. The title is The Reality of the Invisible God. Most of you are familiar with the Old Testament story of a man named Job. The book begins with Job as being the most respected man in his community. Everyone revered him, they looked up to him. But then one day, without notice, suddenly Job fell on hard times. In just a matter of days, he lost everything he had. He lost his family. He had seven sons. He had three beautiful daughters. He lost his friends, even though the three of them turned out to be fair weather friends. He lost his fortune. He had cattle. He had sheep. Job had it going on. He lost his fame because everyone in the community knew of him in high regard, but when he lost everything, they started doing what a lot of people do, they started finger pointing. About the only thing that Job had left after everything else was gone was his faith in God, and he was about to lose that too. It was in chapter 22 of this book when hard times made Job ask a question that he thought he would never have to ask. And the question was, has anyone here seen God? Here I am in trouble. I need some help. And the God that I have been serving cannot be found. If anyone knows where he is, tell him I'm looking for him, and I have one or two complaints that I would like to lodge. Job was so upset, he was so frustrated with his horrible circumstances that he found himself doing everything he could to make an appointment to get in to see his master and have a personal conversation with him regarding why God was allowing all these things to happen to him. It took 37 chapters of ranting and raving and complaining by Job when God finally shows up in chapter 38 in the form of a whirlwind. He didn't show up how Job wanted him to show up, but he finally showed up when he got ready. And he did not come to be interrogated. As a matter of fact, God asked Job, who in the world do you think you are questioning me? Where were you when I created this universe? I just wonder this morning, has anyone here ever needed God and you need him, not yesterday, you need him right now, and you could not find him? Has anyone here ever questioned whether God hears us at all, and if he does hear us, does he really care? Do you really matter to him? May I be frank with you this morning, and I know that you're not going to admit it, I wouldn't expect you to, but there are, believe it or not, a few Christians who question the existence of God or ask the question in their mind, is God real? Now would not be a good time for you to say amen, okay? <laughs> Have you ever wondered in your mind or had the courage 
to ask the question out loud, is God real? And if he is, where is he when I need him? Where is he when I hurt? That's what this message is about today. I wanted to use this text in Romans to talk to us about the reality of God. Paul says a few things in these couple of verses. He says, <clears throat> in a nutshell, God has been here since the beginning of time, even though he can't be seen because he's invisible. Next, he says that this invisible God has demonstrated his eternal powers all along. It's no secret. Then he says, God's divine nature wants us to understand him by what he has already done. And then Paul concludes these two verses by saying, therefore, we have no excuse to doubt or believe in the existence of God. All that is in these two verses. And I'm going to take a little time, not a lot of time, to be theological with you this morning. First thing the writer would have us to know is that God is visible slash invisible, and he wants us to know that he exists even though we can't see him with the human eye. Even though we can't see God with these visible, with these human eyes, God has done enough already for us to see him clearly with naked faith. I, I love that. This is called revelation. That means that God wants to be known and God wants to reveal himself. God wants us to realize that it's he who is running this universe and he doesn't need any help and he can do this all by himself. One day King David thought about how big God is and how small he was. And he sat down and he wrote the eighth psalm. And this is what he said. He said, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You who have set your glory above the heavens, out of the mouths of children and infants have you ordained strength because of your enemies. And then he goes on to make this statement. When I think about, when I consider the heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon, the stars, everything that you've set in place, I've got to ask this question. What is man or who am I that you are mindful of me and the son of man that you care about us? Have you ever considered how big God is? Every time we examine the universe, we can see the visible fingerprints and the visible footprints of God all over it. The evidence of his presence is all around us. We have a snapshot of God. Whenever we look at the stars, the sun, and the moon, we can see and we can know there is a God. When we see the high, majestic, snow-capped mountains that stand guard hovering over the earth below, we can see that God put them there and not us. When we stand on some sandy beach, and I love sandy beaches, and view the vast, endless waves of water that chase each other out to the sea and back. They seem to be playing tag. We see that there is a God somewhere. When we consider the entire world of swimming creatures beneath the sea and how they depend on God only for their survival, not to mention the cattle on a thousand hills and even the hills that the cattle stand on, we too must declare how majestic is his name in all the earth. Only 
And the Bible says this, only a fool would say, there is no God. Revelation means that God wants to be known, and therefore he reveals himself. That's why there is order in the universe. He reveals himself in creation. He reveals himself in Mother Nature. He reveals himself through Father Time, in that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And sometimes it seems that Father Time moves all so slow. And I was kidding with Randy this morning, but when you get our age, seems like he moves real fast. <laughs> seems like one birthday is coming right after the other. God is invisible, yet he's visible. God has revealed himself through revelation, but his most powerful revelation, his most powerful revelation is when he wrote a book about himself and he called it the Bible and he gave it to us and then he showed up one night in Bethlehem wrapped in swaddling clothes and disguised as a baby. The Bible is God's family photo album. We can see him on every page. If you want to know what God looks like, then open his family photo album. But if you really want to see what he looks like up close and personal, look at Jesus. Look at his son, Jesus. God <coughs> has an identical son, and his name is Jesus. Jesus once told his inquiring disciples that if you have seen me, you have seen my father, for the God father and I are one. Have you seen him for yourself? Then the second thing that we need to know about this text is that God not only wants us to see him through the eye of revelation, but God wants us to feel his divine spiritual touch and power and hear his voice through inspiration. God wants us to see him, but he also wants us to feel him. He wants us to hear him. He wants us to experience his divine power. He wants us to experience his divine touch. He wants us to be a part of him and he wants to be a part of us. Therefore, and don't miss this, he blows his breath on us. That's called inspiration. And those of you who are medical know the term pneuma, which we get our word pneumonia. Pneuma means the breath of God. He breathes. <laughs> On us. That's what happened in the Garden of Eden when he picked up the dust. It was nothing until God went, and when he breathed on it, limbs started moving, hearts started palpitating. Only then did man become a living, breathing soul. Once God reveals himself and lets us know that he's real, he then moves on for his purposes by touching us with his breath. He speaks to us through his touch. That's how we first got the Bible. That's, no one sat out on a hill and said, I think I'll write a Bible. The scripture says in Peter, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old times by the will of man, <coughs> but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That's called inspiration. Whenever God wants something done through human beings, he moves them by inspiration. He blows on us. He inspires us. I like to call it God whisper. Whenever we do wrong and something inside of us makes us feel guilty, that's God whisper. Whenever we do right and it makes us feel good inside that's God whisper. 
Whenever we find ourselves in times of trouble and the storms of life start blowing on our boats just like it did Job, there is a still, small voice inside telling us, just like now through this corona, through the social unrest, everything's going to be all right. I got this. That's God whispering. The Bible calls it Holy Ghost. A lot of folk are scared of that term, Holy Ghost. God whispering to, uh, to our souls is not from the outside in, it's from the inside out. God has a way of touching our souls by blowing on us and moving us by inspiration. When you do something spectacular, beyond what you have ever done in your life, and you know that it wasn't you, but it was God working in you, that's inspiration. You have been inspired. Paul tells us that the invisible God reveals himself in ways that causes us to see him, <coughs> and we call it revelation, but then after God has our attention and we notice him, he moves in us and on us and empowers us to go beyond ourselves. We call that inspiration. But then God wants us to not only know he's there and hear him, but he wants us to understand. And what he's doing, why he's doing it, and how he's doing it, and the word for that is illumination. So here's the third thing and the last thing I want to say, and then I'm going to leave you alone. God gives his children spiritual understanding and enlightenment through illumination. I don't mind telling you, I had a wonderful conversation the other day. Anybody here know the theologian that comes here on a bicycle named Gerhardt? Everybody know Gerhardt? I had a conversation with him because he read the title of this sermon. He said, that's what I'm working on back there. That's what I'm working on. I'm working on revelation, inspiration, and illumination and enlightenment. You got it. You got it. And he and I sat down for an hour. We talked about just the title of this sermon. Matter of fact, he motivated me. That's why I'm so fired up this morning. God wants to be known. God wants to be felt, but God wants to have spiritual, have us have spiritual understanding about who he is, that's his nature, what he wants, that's his will, and why he wants it, that's his purpose. He turns the lights on in our mind. We have an aha moment. The one reason that most Christians struggle with the Bible and find it so difficult to understand is because they're not really convinced <coughs> about God, of who he is, what he wants, why he wants it, and why does he want us. They have never felt the spiritual power of him touching their life, and they have little or no understanding about who God is, what God wants, and what he wants them to do, and why. In 1 Corinthians, and you can read it when you get home, in chapter 2, verses 6 through 16, paraphrasing, Paul says worldly Christians are Christians who don't have the mind of Christ. Operating, they are operating with what's called a carnal mind. He calls these kinds of Christians having a natural mind and do not understand the things of God. They are thinking and reasoning about spiritual things with a worldly mind. I'm going to tell you what that's like. That's like taking a five-year-old child and enrolling them in college instead of taking them to kindergarten. They just won't get it. Until you have the mind of Jesus, nothing spiritual will make sense. Not church, not the Bible, not tithing, uh-oh. And we will continue to ask the wrong questions. What's in this for me? Instead of, Lord, 
What will you have me to do for you? That's the same question his disciples asked him <clears throat> until they had a resurrection experience. In order to be an effective child of God, we must first know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he is. We must then be willing to allow him to come inside, inside of us, and we must then yield to him and yield our will and the touch of his Holy Spirit, and then allow the light of illumination shine in our hearts and minds to have that aha moment. How does this happen? It can't happen unless you first go by the cross. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. Have you been by the cross? The cross is the place where we first see God. Father, thank you for the power of your word, Lord, as you have used revelation, inspiration, and illumination to give us some understanding that you are here. You are more real than these pews. You are more real than brick and mortar and stained glass windows. You are the most real reality in our lives. So we thank you now. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray it all. Amen. The communion meditation today is taken from a book called Wishful Thinking by Frederick Beekman. It's a collection of essays, and this essay, essay is entitled The Lord's Supper. To eat this particular meal together is to meet at the level of our most basic humanness, which involves our need not just for food, but for each other. I need you to help fill my emptiness just as you need me to help fill yours. As for the emptiness that's still left over, well, we're in it together, or it in us. Maybe it's most of what makes us humans and what makes us brothers and sisters. The next time you walk down the street, take a good look at every face you pass and in your mind say, Christ died for you. That girl, that sloth, that phony, that crook, that saint, that darn fool. Christ died for you. Take this and eat in remembrance that Christ died for you. To come together around the sacred table of communion of the Lord's Supper. Two things that Jesus gave us as ordinances are baptism, which is the entry into the Christian family, after we have received Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we go down in the water, we come back up. It symbolizes the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. <clears throat> but then he says, often as you do this, some do it yearly, some do it monthly, and I love how we do it weekly, as often as we come together. This is the body <clears throat> of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And let me instruct you again, as we did all last week, uh, as simple as this looks, it's sometimes not easy. It is a two-pronged uh, activity. There are two pullbacks. The first little plastic pullback will reveal your wafer, okay? And you shouldn't have any problem with that. I experienced that for the years. My problem comes when I pull back the second one which if you need some assistance from someone here, just raise your hand, we'll be glad to help you. But the first one is the bread, the wafer. Let us break bread together as Christ commanded us. And then the wine, which 
we call the fruit of the vine, represents his shed blood, which was shed for the remission of sins for all of us. We might have a right to treat it right. Let us drink as a family together.